The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. We are back. Giants, San Francisco Giants baseball in the zone. I'm Ralph Tycho, and um, the host is Michael Duca. How are you, Michael? I'm not bad at all, Ralph. How about yourself? I'm pretty good. You're recovering from uh, flu-like symptoms. Some, some of it was allergies. Some, some of it was the flu. But whatever it was, it had you down, and you were traveling. Um, I'm glad it didn't get worse. I am too, and and you were right. Um, some of it was flu, and some of it was allergies, and none of it was fun. I could well imagine. Um, you mentioned that you suffer from allergies on a somewhat regular basis. Do they owe? Does the symptoms always manifest itself in flu-like symptoms, or is it just sometimes sniffles? Well, your eyes are red. <clears throat> It's it's hard for me to imagine that our listeners are really interested in this, Ralph, but since you asked, I was never allergic to anything. (laughs) I was never allergic to anything until after I turned 60, and I really didn't think you could develop allergies that late in life, but you can. I don't know what I'm allergic to because the doctor has said it would be too painful too long and too expensive just to figure out what it is that you probably can't actually immunize yourself against anyway. Um, So we just treat it. I take Zyrtec every day. And for the most part, it stays away. Once in a while, I will catch a day like I did earlier this week where I just I wake up in the morning sneezing and I sneeze and go through a box of Kleenex in the course of the day. My eyes water. I'm cleaning my glasses probably every five or six minutes because, you know, if I sneeze or if I blow my nose, my eyes water and it splatters all over my glasses, so I have to wash off the salt water. Um, And if that hasn't put everybody off their dinner, uh, that's pretty much it. It, You know, it's, it's the strangest thing in the world. It feels like the start of a cold, except that you don't get the chills or the fevers. Right. And then uh, in my case, uh, usually I will uh, suffer through it for a full day and then go to sleep and wake up in the morning and I'm fine. You know, yesterday I did not sneeze one time. Um, the day before, I don't think I went five minutes without a sneeze in the entire day. Well, it could be the pollen in the air or that might have a, an effect on it. But yeah, I have no idea. I'm glad you're getting through it. How about that? That's let's good. I am too. Little, let's talk a little Giants baseball. Uh, they solidified themselves in this off season like no team I can remember um, making three excellent moves. And um, you tell me what impresses you the most about the off-season dealings? Well, <clears throat> it's very interesting. Today's Chronicle, John Shea, my friend, uh, San Diego State alumnus, has uh, an article, and I, I dropped him an email about that article. And I told him, John, I know you don't write your own headlines in the paper. However, the headline on your story says, the Giants got older but better. And I said, you know, it's stretching it to say they got older. They, they, you know, Pablo Sandoval's 31, Evan Longoria's 32, uh, Denard Spann's 33, and uh, Austin uh, and, and McCutcheon is 31, and uh, Austin Jackson's 30, about to turn 31, and Jared Parker's 29, about to turn 30. So they traded 93 years for 94. They got a few months older, but they got a whole lot better. A whole lot better. I don't think they they gave up Parker, did they? No, they didn't give up Parker. They gave up, um, and they didn't give up Elio Ramos, who everyone wants, the 17-year-old semi-phenom out of uh, the Dominican Republic. 
Uh, they and they did give, give up the guy else. you really like as a long shot, a bit of a long shot, is Dugar. Yeah, Stephen Duggar is still going to be Duggar. in the picture. In the picture. I think they're going to let um, – they want Jackson to provide them with some stability in center field at the beginning of the year. And it would not surprise me if they go out and try to pick up uh, – you know, somebody with maybe one or two years of major league experience that they can sign for eight hundred thousand um, dollars for you know for the other side of a platoon with Jackson. Jackson uh, was uh, very successful against left-handed pitching last year, but he's only been playing eighty-five to ninety games a year for the last few years. Part of it has been injuries, and part of it has been. His splits are really substantial. He hit like 185 against right-handed pitching last year and 356 against left-handed pitching, and that's a pretty significant difference. I can see McCutcheon playing a lot of center field and maybe Parker. I, I don't know. I don't know about that. I think they want Kutch in right field, and I think whoever you put in right field at AT&T, you leave him there. It's too complicated a place to play. To go in and out of. Michael, uh, would you that, would you compare Spa, Spawn Span to Jackson in terms of uh, what's left in in their tanks? And um, I think sp- Jackson is as good as good a hitter as Span, and a dramatic defensive upgrade. Um, and he's a little faster. I and mean, this is a guy who just five years ago led the American League in consecutive seasons in triples. Mm-hmm. And remember, the American got, League doesn't have a lot of triples ballparks. And you've got a, a, a triple ballpark, a triple waiting to happen at AT&T every 10 minutes. Um, you do. If, you do. Configuration. So that should be nice. I like the idea of Pence moving over to left field, and I like the idea – that even if he's not playing center, McCutcheon has a lot of ground to cover out there, and um, I think they're going to be in much better shape. Well, so when they would you agree that gonna... this is a team that improved themselves uh, more than any team in recent history? Um, I think they had to have picked up 20 games right, right off the bat. Um, well, here, here's how I look at what happened. You know, last year they won 64 games, right? Right. Which left them about 25 or 26 wins shy of being a playoff team. The goal is to be a playoff team. Um, they gave up a starting pitcher, but they gave up a starting pitcher whose numbers proclaimed him to be the worst starting pitcher in all of baseball last year. I don't think Yeah, so whoever you replace him with, you're going to get a plus right there. Well, well. Just by the law of averages. Even if you replaced him with himself, you were going to get an improvement. It it was just, you know, that was just an outlier year. That was an extremely outlier year for him. But remember, the Giants did not have Will Smith last year. They do have Will Smith this year. And while he may not be able to go back-to-back days until somewhere around the All-Star break, they may have to give him a day off after each day that he pitches, he's a distinct upgrade in the bullpen. Right. Um, I am completely stuck and lost for, for the name of the player right now and have no way to look him up. But one of the young players that they got back in that deal is a relief pitcher, a minor league relief pitcher, I believe pitched at the double-A level last year, who throws 100 miles an hour. Whoa. He's an outside shot to make that bullpen this year. And if you add Will Smith to the bullpen that they had at the end of the year last year with, with Dyson and now a healthy Melanson, that's a lights out back into the bullpen right there. Well, so you could that's really you could that's really count maybe um, you could hope for more than a twenty game turnaround. Well, well, let's put it this way: I think that it's not unreasonable to be discussing them as a playoff contending team. Fan graphs before they added Austin Jackson. Fan graphs 
had them as a wild card team. Okay. With the addition um, of Jackson, they may move up to the number one wild card team. I don't know that anybody's going to catch the Dodgers. I really don't. But how how fearsome are the Dodgers? You know, when you consider that they're 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 still trying to figure out who their starting rotation is. Right. And you got a, a rookie first baseman out of out of Sacramento who hit more home runs than he probably ever dreamt of hitting in, in a major league career. Uh, and you've got what used to be known as the Southmore Jinx year. And um, well, certainly uh, Cody Bellinger is going to have to uh, have to adjust to the adjustments that will be made to him. Right. Right. So, um, oh yeah, you, you can't. Uh, it shows me. It showed me last year that the Dodgers were not going to be a dynasty. When although they won like 15 games in a row, they lost about 15 games in a row, and it took a lot to steady the ship in August and September. So um, they're they're vulnerable for sure. Well, I think as long you know, you might be able in a postseason, Ralph, to sustain this idea of no starting pitcher except Kershaw gets to face the opposing lineup a third time. But you can't do that for 162 games leading into the postseason because you're going to need 30 guys in the bullpen. It's just. It is not right. possible to get 30 innings a week out of your bullpen. Very good point. Very good point. As a Met fan, I um, I uh, threw up a little bile in my in my mouth with that because they're talking about the exact same thing to preserve uh, their pitchers. I don't know. The jury is still out. Do you preserve the pitcher, or do you give them innings? and let them build up arm strength. Um, and that's still probably the number number one question in baseball is how do you reverse the, the pitching injuries? Um, is it too much work in the minors? Is it too much work in amateur ball? Uh, what do you think? Well, I have a lot of opinions on that matter. We can probably fill the rest of the show. But bottom line to me is this. A friend of mine who was a favorite nutrition 30 years ago and who worked for the Texas Rangers by the name of Craig Wright wrote a book called The Diamond Appraised along with Tom House. And they went back and forth chapter after chapter. They picked the subject. House gave the kind of old school pitching coach eye test point of view and Craig gave the sabermetric analytical point of view on that subject. And Craig pretty much convinced me in that book, and you can find it and read it yourself, that the key is how many innings you put on a kid's arm, how many stressful innings and how many total innings you put on a kid's arm before his 22nd birthday. Who, in your own experience, Ralph, who – was the pitcher that had the greatest longevity and the ability to be a power pitcher for the longest career in your lifetime? Nolan Ryan. Exactly. How many major league innings did Nolan Ryan throw before his 22nd birthday? Uh, probably not many because About he didn't throw many with the Mets even when they won in 69. He wasn't part he didn't of the regular the rotation. Because they had no, he had no idea where the baseball was going when it left his hand. Right. His wildness probably contributed to his longevity. Because Interesting, though, what, that I can think of Sandy Koufax, who didn't pitch many innings as a young youngster, youngster, if you will. Um, yeah, but Ko Koufax and, did not lose his career to an arm injury. it turned out just the opposite. Koufax didn't lose his career to an arm injury. 
Kofax lost his career to a congenital nerve problem. That was always going to happen no matter what. Good point. So, in, you know, what, what, what Craig came down to was major league and minor league innings, you don't want a kid to have more than 800 professional innings by the time he's 22. Okay. There Good. seemed to be a, 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 an, an almost guaranteed breakoff point there where if you, if you didn't overuse a kid when he was young and you didn't overstress him when he was young, then that shoulder capsule was able to knit in a healthy fashion from strength and provide you with a good base to be able to throw for many, many years. So the answer to your question is get rid of travel teams, get these kids playing more than one sport, yes, have them throw hard, yes, have them throw fastballs, yes, have them build up their arms by playing, but do not put them in competitive innings game after game, week after week, all the way around the year. Give them yeah. six or eight months and off. And tell the parents not to breed their kids to be baseball players or anything. Exactly. exactly. Get out there and develop all of your skills. Greatest player we ever saw, you and I both, is Willie Mays. And like we discussed last week, you know, we're talking about a guy who was an all-state football player and an all-state basketball player in Alabama, in addition to being a professional baseball player by the time he was 16. So, And you, you know, there are many players like Vita Blue who were two or three sport athletes. Um, absolutely. That help, help themselves quite a bit by, uh, as you say, developing muscles, muscle skills or muscle memory that um, will transcends to baseball. But now I'm going to say something that will, in the face of it, contradict everything I just said. I think that teams need to go back to four-man rotations. Well, instead of a, a six like some like the Mets are talking instead about, of sixes and fives, because yeah. a four-man rotation lets you throw, rest, throw rest, throw, rest. A five-man rotation gives you an extra day somewhere, and that extra day isn't helping, it's hindering. Couple that with the notion that if you actually had four starters instead of five, that you could have an eight-man bullpen and still only have a 12-man pitching staff. If right. you're if you're lopping off your least effective starter, you're also lopping off your greatest chance for stressful impact on your bullpen. In other words, that fifth guy is likely is not to require five bullpen innings. But if he doesn't pitch at all, the number one guy comes around that much more often. But, Michael, isn't there a tendency for players nowadays to throw long ball the next day after a start, long tosses and what happens. Long toss? Well, a, a lot of them use long toss to warm up for their start. Uh, Barry Zito used to do that. Trevor Bauer is probably the most famous for doing that because his long toss is truly impressive. He stands in front of the foul pole and throws the ball to his catcher who is standing in front of the other foul pole all the way across the outfield. Well, that's Catchers always toss. need a cutoff man, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, and that's been Bauer's routine since he was at UCLA. But it's, yeah, I just think that, that the combination of letting kids throw breaking pitches when they're 12, 13, 14 years old, stressing their arms by having them throw too many innings, uh, I mean, it's classic examples. I mean, absolutely classic examples. Think back on how many pitchers out of the University of Texas and Arizona State and Wichita State got drafted in the first round and how few of them had an impact in the major leagues. Yeah, Von Poppel the... comes to mind and David Clyde comes to mind. Huh? Um, 
and, 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 and tons of others. The only one who comes to mind that actually had a lengthy career is Roger Clemens. Right. Out of all of those guys. And the reason is the coaches that they had in college had no compunction whatsoever about asking for 200 innings out of these guys in a college season. A college season only has 70 or 80 games. But these guys would start every Friday game, and they might relieve on Sunday. Right. That's, and and you know, again, that, guys like they were invariably Justin younger Bruce, than 22. So that they were invariably uh, right younger, and and you had guys like Cliff Gustafson in the Texas who would just burn them up, not burn them out, burn them up. Just and, exhaust you know, what they there's, had. Also, there's also the theory: it's not the number of innings that you throw necessarily; it's the number of stressful innings when you got to reach back and get out of your body, so to speak. And, and, and that's, that's Sparky Anderson. Sparky said a guy has two jams. When he gets into his third, I know he's coming out at the end of the inning if he doesn't come out in the middle of the inning. That was, that, uh, I mean, that, that was a hard and fast rule with Sparky. Nobody has the arm strength and the stamina to get out of three major league champs. Well, that is, if you look at it that way, one can almost predict when a pitching change is going to be made. You know, a few you, could... you can, and in fact, what, you know, um, you, you get guys like Bruce Bochy who sat behind the plate and caught tens, if not hundreds of thousands of pitches, he can tell from the dugout when a guy is losing a mile or two off his fastball. And when a guy is losing a mile or two off his fastball, it's time to begin warming someone up, whether you use them or not. Now, there's a whole other set of controversies. Felipe Alou was particularly notorious for this, um, of what the pitchers in the bullpen call a dry hump. That's when you get up and you warm up to go in a game right. and you don't get used and you sit down and you get no appearance. Um, and the Giants did that so much that they had to actually change their internal rule. Most teams have a, have a, a, a hard and fast rule. Two ups is an in. In other words, if you get up and warm up twice in a bullpen, that's the same amount of stress on your arm as if you went in and pitched an inning in the game. So you count that as an appearance. Mm. Felipe would warm up so many guys, you know. I mean, Jim Brower used to laugh about it with me. We'd 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 sit and talk before games, and I'd say, you know, what's the over under today? And he said two and a half. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it would be uh, the Giants actually changed that rule to three. Three ups counted as an in because if you started counting two ups as an in, nobody was available. Right. Well, Felipe a, a was lot of that goes to how how your starters are doing. Your you, the best laid plans of mice and men often go astray when you're not getting the innings out of the, out of the starters. That's true, but you also can make some mistakes in the other direction, and there's a classic one. You know, um, if you warm up your guys over and over and over again and don't bring them in, they're not going to be as mentally sharp when you do bring them in, and they're not going to be as physically sharp when you do bring them in. And a classic example of that, a guy who Felipe Alou said, I don't trust him in a game anymore, get rid of him, Joe Nathan. I think Joe Nathan went on to have a pretty decent career once he left the Giants. Yes, he did. Another guy started out as a catcher and became uh, in the minors and became a... Uh, he started out as a shortstop. He was a shortstop oh, on okay. Long Island. He was a shortstop. Troy Percival was a catcher and a yes. terrific re- relief pitcher. Uh, Percy was a catcher and so so is uh, the Dodgers' closer. Oh, was he a catcher as well? Yes. Yes, he was. Ah. 
Yeah, the Kelly Jansen or, or Kelsey Jansen. Yeah, Kenley, Kenley, Kenley. Kenley. They just re-signed him, and that's a, that's a good move um, as far as I'm concerned. P- relief pitching is so tough to, to gauge who's going to be next year's successful relief pitcher. It's almost Well, amazing. Giants fans Giants fans got spoiled. I mean, they really got spoiled. The core four were together for several years. And if you look around baseball, that just doesn't happen. Right. You knew Mariano Rivera was going to come into uh, you know to the Sandman um, in the ninth inning, but look at how many different guys he had setting him up over the years. Absolutely, yeah. Um, is it going to come to because I, there are a lot of managers promising this? Uh, the A's manager is, is uh, saying it. Uh, he's one that comes to mind. Melvin is saying that I'm going to use my bullpen situationally. It may be the seventh inning where, when I think the game needs closing down, and uh, it depend depending on who's coming up, um, the, the opponents that are coming up. And I may just go to my my closer situationally. Do you think baseball is ready for that that change of uh, this guy's a seventh inning guy, this guy's an eighth inning guy, uh, that sort of thing? Is that on, well on the horizon? First of all, first of all, there's there's so many contradictory statements that are made about this. You have somebody like Bill James who says, statistically, you should use your closer exactly like you just said. You should use your best pitcher to get the three toughest outs the last time through the lineup. Statistically, if that's in the seventh inning, that's when you use him. If it's the eighth inning, that's when you use him. You don't wheel Mariano Rivera out to phase seven, eight, nine in the order. You don't need to. And sometimes they didn't. But the players' union is going to opt for that closer's salary slot, and which makes motivation to come in in the seventh inning for a player who's, when he goes for a contract, they're always looking at, well, how many saves, that kind of thing. So well, that's going to have to change. That's going to have to change. There's this, you know, somehow baseball managed to function for 80 years without the save. The save is a, is a, is a statistic that was only invented in 1960. Oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't. Ah. And so when and, you look back on the guys that the played before, they're just going back to the records and creating. Saves, am I correct? They're imputing saves. If they're imputing saves based on the current rule, you know. And who was who was generally regarded as the as the first closer, as the greatest relief pitcher of baseball's first sixty five years? Jim Constanti. Wait, no, Jimmy Constanti. Oh, you're right. Yeah, the whiz kids. And, and Jim Constanti, in his best year, would have saved twenty games. In his best year. Elroy Face, 14 saves and 18 and 1 for the 1960 Pirates. 18 wins out of the bullpen. So the way pitchers are used has changed over the years and it will continue to change. The goal is still the same get outs, win the game. Now, Here's where it gets interesting. The players themselves, if you talk to a a, a setup man and a closer, and particularly if you talk to a setup man whose closer got injured and he got promoted to the ninth inning, he'll tell you, ain't no difference pitching the eighth inning or the ninth inning. It's all the same. It's all the same. It's all the same. It's three guys. It's all the same. You talk to a starting pitcher, and he'll tell you there's nothing like the ninth inning. Those are the three toughest outs in the game, and they always will be. So, Somebody's not figuring this out. You know, right, well, the sabermetricians will tell you some your players. Some players could handle the pressure of the ninth inning, and it doesn't seem like. See, you know, cool beans, no big thing. 
and some people and some players can't handle that pressure, so it becomes important. Or well, you get a it Tim Worrell who pressure. closed for the Giants. Tim Worrell closed for the Giants for a year after being a setup man for many years. And I flat out asked him, I said, is there any difference? He said, yeah, I have to get up 10 minutes later to warm up. <laughs> That's it. That's all. That's it. He said, eighth inning, ninth inning, doesn't matter. you got to get three outs and let no runs in. The job's the right. same job. Very good. Was it George Will that wrote a book about the bullpen? Uh, maybe not. Um, do it. I have it on my shelf somewhere, and I, I don't uh, know right now. But there was uh, bull, life in the bullpen, or something like that. Uh, talking about it, I know Bronson talked about it way back in Long Ball. And in the pennant race that he wrote, iconic books in the 50s, uh, Jim Bronson, rest of his soul. Brosnan. Jim Brosnan. Brosnan. Yes, he had, yeah. he had some, some, some great, great one. Are you thinking of uh, Pen Men by Bob Cairns? Mm, yes, exactly. Yes, Pen Men. Um, a great book about, about the bullpen. Mm -hmm. So, one thing about baseball, it as and you know it personally from your writing experience, it is so well chronicled and has been over the years that it gives us a chance to really, by reading, look into the game at the way it was and what it's evolved to. Um, is there any, you're an old school guy, but is there any, I'm going to ask you this off the cuff, is there anything about the new game that you prefer to the old game? Well, I guess it depends on what you define as the old game. Um, and what's old to me... Um, well, guys trying to get the ball, never, get guys over, hit and run... Uh, that sort of thing. Not not everybody strike out 220 20 times to hit 24 home runs. That that kind of thing. Well, I like. Um, I don't know. Uh, one of the things that I dislike about the new game is the unnecessary emphasis on walks as a form of offense. Um, I really like baseball when hitters get up in the box and attack the pitcher. I really like baseball when pitchers get on the rubber and attack the hitter. I really dislike it when everybody's nibbling and looking for an edge and trying to, you know, convince the umpire that that pitch was an eighth of an inch off the plate. Well, in your book, isn't there the expression, walks as good as a hit? Uh, there is that expression. I've never believed it to be true, and I still don't, although, you know, uh, there are there are times when it can be advantageous. Let's put it this way. I have no problem with a leadoff hitter looking at a lot of pitches, working the count, and maybe taking a walk a game, you know, winding up with 150, 160 walks at the end of the season. Theoretically, he's got speed. Theoretically, he's got a guy right behind him who can handle the bat and move him over. And you've got the, you know, the meat of the order coming up. Your run producers coming up. You want to get off to an early lead in the game. It changes things all around. I get all that, and I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is watching a guy who you expect to hit 42 or 45 or 50 home runs in a year work in the count. I have well, a problem. Did, Bonds you ever, you did Tony... Barry Bonds ever swing at a ball that was off the plate when he was putting those five incredible years together where he was in a zone that was uh, unbelievable? Well, Ralph, you know, that's that's like asking me to compare my last flight on Southwest with Chuck Yeager. It's just not fair. 
It's just not a fair question. Nobody had the eye and the bat speed of Barry Bonds. Nobody. Probably in history. Probably ever. Um, yeah. You know, he, he had the uncanny ability. He had the eye of a Ted Williams and the bat speed of Gary Sheffield. Yeah. You know, I had an answer for somebody that told me that, yeah, he did all those things on PEDs. And I said, yeah, but he was batting against pitchers that were more than likely on PEDs themselves. That was always my response in the press box, was if you want to, if you want to subtract all the home runs that you think he hit on PEDs, that's fine, as long as you'll count double all the home runs he hit off PEDs to oh. wind up with 800 because more of the pitchers were juiced for more years than he was. See, people always lose sight of that, that um, it, it worked both ways. That, um, I got it, it, More than that, more than that, it worked much better for relief pitchers than for anyone else because what does it do? It lets you recover faster. It lets you work out more because you recover faster. Exactly. That's a high and, But you can make the case like that. That, that Bonds recovered faster, too, so that he didn't have to take Willie's juice, if you were, um, you or think Greenies or, or what have you. Um, well, okay, except... What is it that he was recovering from? Everybody says he, he loafed in the outfield. He didn't run out ground balls. He walked 200 times a year and hit the ball out of the park another 75. So what's he recovering from? Well, he recovering from the dog days of summer. I don't care. It, it, it takes a hell of a lot of energy to swing the bat with intensity the way he, he swung it. And he didn't loaf in the field. As a matter of fact, arm notwithstanding, um, and he, as you say, he made up for a weak er arm by learning to hit the cutoff man, by getting the ball out of his glove, and, and all those things. Um, unless, I, I don't see, um, I don't see that. I don't see that um, he was just a hitter, and that's nothing to recover from. Well, I'm just playing devil's advocate for you there. I'm, I'm I thought giving so. you all, all, all of the silliness that I heard over the years. Um, but here's what I can tell you. Here's what I have seen with my own eyes. I've seen Aaron Judge hit home runs at a spectacular rate. But I haven't seen anybody be like Eric Gagne and stand out there on the mound with bird legs and throw 100 miles an hour three days out of four since they began getting serious about testing and cleaning this up. Right. There is no question in my mind but that pitchers, you know, I mean, how many relief pitchers can throw 100 miles an hour now? Chapman and who else? Chat, yeah, Chapman can. Uh, and who else? Well, yeah, I can't think of I can't think of anybody else at the top of my head. Well, there isn't anybody else who can throw a hundred with command and control. So, but you know, fifteen years ago, every team had somebody that could throw a hundred miles an hour. Right. So what you're saying, maybe baseball is getting on top of the. Um, and I'll put it in quotes, the drug problem. Oh, no, I'm not saying that. Oh, no, 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 no. No, I'm, they are getting on top of the steroid problem. That's what I meant, but, the steroid. But there's still, okay. but there's still but then no, there's the human growth there's still, no valid te- there's still no valid test for human growth hormone. And I have always maintained, Ralph, that by the time we solve the steroid problem, people will laugh that anybody ever thought it was a problem because the players will be genetically enhanced. 
Wow. And, you know, you could also make an argument for, if you want to talk about enhancement, unnatural enhancement, you can go to the eye doctor as a player, and if your vision is 2020, they'll make it 2010. Um, is that not an artificial enhancement? They'll give you Ted Williams-like vision today in a manner that wasn't even around 10 years ago. Well, all of that is true. Um, and, you know, a case can be made for, um, I don't know, I think a case can be made for a whole lot of things. I mean, how many years, you know, a subject near and dear to your heart, how long has the battle gone on to reclassify cannabis into being a medical substance, a substance with medical value. Federal government still says it has none. Mm -hmm. But there's tens of millions of people in this country who use it on a daily basis now as a medication. And Do, do you remember when Robert that, Parrish, the basketball player who played the most minutes in the NBA – the year he was busted for a pound, which in those days was scandalous, uh, a pound of boo. And uh, everybody said, well, you know, how does this guy smoke Jay and run up and down the court? Well, I would wonder how... Um, Timing. If, Timing. <laughs> yeah. It's not um, if you smoke, it's when. Absolutely. And... But it's used for things medically, that, um, mentally, that wasn't even conceived of until they, talk to, they were talking about um, legalization. What I got my medical card for, my marijuana medical card in California, was literally for floating anxiety and trouble sleeping. Now, there are some states that legalize medical marijuana, but you almost have to be totally disabled, either mentally or physically, to qualify for a card. Uh, I'm wondering from you, is on the inside of baseball, are they looking at marijuana a little bit differently than they were 10 years ago? I don't know. I don't know. It's still listed as a drug of abuse in the um, drug treatment program that is protocol that is uh, an addendum to the basic agreement. Okay. Uh, do they? And that's going to you know, that 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 that's that's going to be problematic in in Washington and Colorado and California because. Uh, I mean, employers can set whatever standards they want, and yes, you can, you know, the employer can terminate your employment, terminate your contract if you're using uh, a substance that is otherwise legal in your state. Uh, to wit, Major League Baseball players are supposedly not allowed to use chewing tobacco. Minor League players are absolutely not allowed to use chewing tobacco. Um they can be suspended or terminated for using it. Uh, you're not supposed to show up to work drunk, no matter what field you're in. But, you know, it's that, that, that's a drug of abuse in the baseball terms also. So, you know, I think baseball's on solid footing by telling the people in those states, no, you still can't do it. On the other hand, you know, you run into the silliness of, 49ers uh, linebacker Reuben Foster being arrested for being in possession of a few grams of marijuana in Alabama, it, you know, and, and that's utterly legal where he came from, and he was arrested like, what, one or two days after the season ended, so it was probably stuff he bought with him from here. Well, I, I didn't read that. That was, that was news to me. I think um, at this point the, the horse is out of the barn on on cannabis. I agree. So, 
I agree. He, he's my out, wife he's out raising As a matter of fact, Dempsey I heard Wakefield. a commercial. The Giants did this commercial it called – they said something about it's chronic. You know what that is. Do you remember that dur- during the year? Um, I don't. They joked about chronic. Anyway, well, was it, was it off, off that a little like bit, I just history? want to say I'm glad the Giants kept panic. Made chronic oh, made, yeah. me, made me think about that. He is so solid, and keeping that infield together, I'm one that believes in what the old Keystone combo, uh, the Nelly Fox, Louis Aparicio type thing where you played together for four or five years, um, the Russell Lopes. Um, I, I think it behooves a team to be strong up the middle and keep the same four guys in um, for a long period of time. And now well, the Giants and have – yeah, they have Posey have and now a, a – pardon me? They have three of the four in Posey, Panic, and Crawford. Yeah, and right. I, I'm surprised – if you have a stopgap that will get you through – through a year or so until Duger develops or, um, you know, next year is the biggest free agent uh, market going from what I understand. Um, and there's still Bryce Harper out there. And I wonder um, if he might not be a good fit with the Giants. Just, uh, oh, he'd be a great fit with the Giants, but I don't see him ever coming here. Um, the problem, I can express the problem with Bryce Harper in exactly two words. Scott Boris. Right. Who controls about 17 of the 18 um, un, unsigned free agents that are still out there, and we're getting into February. This mm-hmm. That's an unprecedented um thing in baseball generally you know with two three weeks away from pitches and catches you got to know what's happening well you know i mean it's it's interesting it's interesting to see whether this is a market correction whether this is another form of collusion i don't know um players are getting signed but um the luxury tax is having the effect of being a salary cap. And the reason it's having that effect is that while it's a soft cap, it's a cap that has increasingly draconian penalties. If you know, The reason the Giants are so adamant about trying to stay below $197 million this year is that if they go over, it'll be their fourth year in a row. And they will not only pay a 100% penalty, but they will lose draft picks and they will lose international slot money. So, you know, the, the penalties are enormous if you're over for an extended period of time. Of course, that was designed and aimed at the Dodgers and the Yankees, but nobody was expecting that there were going to be other teams that would have such financial success that they would be able to play in the same markets as New York and Los Angeles. Okay. Michael, is Sabian still making the decisions on player personnel? I think he has a very, very strong influence on them because of his background. At, you know, He was a coach. He was a scout. He was a scouting director. Talent evaluation is what he does. Okay. I think I Are think you John happy Barr with their off-season moves? Team. I'm very happy with their off-season moves. I, uh, I mean, I, I was expecting them to perhaps go out and find Gerard Dyson as a center fielder who would have been purely a defensive play. Um, I'm kind of surprised and kind of pleased that they went after Jackson and and succeeded in getting him, um, who's got a little bit of offense to add to the purely defensive play. Now the question is, 
is this going to be a platoon? And if it is a platoon, then you might be correct. You could see, you know, Jarrett Parker is the other side of that platoon because he's a pretty decent left-hander who hits right-handers pretty well. Right. And w- with him, co- with Parker coming into his own, it could give Pence a little t- more time off to either recover mentally or, or, or physically because he does well, we'll play balls I mean, the wall, and sometimes that can come back and hurt you over, over a long period of time. Well, apparently kale is not Teflon. Apparently right. eating lots and lots of kale does not guarantee that you're not going to get injured because he's had his share of woes the last couple of years. Well, um, like with Cespedes of the Mets, a lot of them have been – muscle pulls, hamstrings, and what have you, and they have kind of have the feeling with Cespedes that it's hydration with him. And I wonder if that might not be the case with Pence, if, um, you know, muscles cramp up, this, that, and the other thing. But Could be, but, but I can tell you that the Giants training staff, uh, as far back as 2000, um, told guys to start hydrating five days before a an East Coast trip. Uh, they were well aware of the issues. And for many, many, many years, under Mark Laton in particular, the Giants uh, had the fewest – there was a stretch of like seven years consecutively over which they had in each year the fewest days lost to injury and cumulatively the fewest days lost to injury. Um, you know, some of that's luck, some of that's being young. Some of that is understanding and, and being prepared. I mean, I had a long conversation with um, – um, uh, oh, God, I'm blanking on his name. He's down in L.A. now. Oh, Conti? Yes, Stan Conti. Stan Conti about um, performance-enhancing drugs. And he was the one who pointed out to me that probably the greatest single performance-enhancing drug you can take is water. Because he said, don't drink enough and watch your performance go to hell. Wow. But in the old days, they would you'd have to almost spit out the water to keep from, quote, cramping up or what have you. Because well, of the yeah. There's that, was, a lot that of was the theory. Yeah, it's, you know... It, in the old days, there was a lot of old wives, and they were running around telling stories. You know, you weren't supposed to go in the water for an hour after you ate either. Uh, right. Oh, I had that. That's not way, the truth. Boy. You know, you you can't catch a cold from going outside without a jacket. You know, I mean, there was just, there was a whole lot of nonsensical stuff, or what we now know to be nonsensical stuff, that was considered in those days just accepted wisdom. Um, we now know that, you know, I mean, geez, in Babe Ruth's day, you know, they used to dip a cabbage leaf in ammonia and wear it under their cap to stay cool. Well, right. not only did that – And not that just that a, in, cool, in, how in the that 50s, healthy? a lot of the Latin players probably still do that in in, in the Midwest and, and in Florida. It wouldn't well, surprise they, me. They may still do that in the Dominican Republic. I don't think they do it in the Midwest and, and in Florida because now there's air conditioning in the, in the dugouts. You know, it just it all makes a little bit more sense now. But right. you know, this was. I mean, stop and think about it for a minute. How how well do you think you could track a fly ball with ammonia in your eyes? Good point. They're <laughs> also making uniforms more conducive to um, comfort in the heat. Caps, um, these new cool breeze style that's, uh, you couldn't tell the difference between that and wool, but it apparently makes a big difference in uh, the caps last longer and they retain the perspiration. Uh, Unis aren't the old-fashioned flannel that we all love uh, that weighed 15 pounds on on a hot summer day and that has to um, improve player performance. So 
sometimes change is good, sometimes it's bad. Um, I still long for the days when of wool caps and flannel uniforms, but uh, but that's well, I don't care about the wool caps and I don't care about the flannel uniforms, but I still long for the days of two hour and fifteen minute games that were two to one and well played. And double headers where you go and you don't think, oh, I got to beat the crowd, I've got to get out of here. You're there because you're there, and you have the privilege of being there. And the fans' mindset was different. It's a different world. I mean, um, uh, I know I'm starting to sound like a geezer, even to myself, uh, but it was... uh, not that it was perfect, not that the 50s, you look back on the 50s, oh, the good old days and this and that. We had the Cold War, you had all kinds of demonstrations, you had Hiroshima, you know, it wasn't, uh, you had Korea, it wasn't all that uh, good old days. It, as no, no, it wasn't, so. but, but, you know, in the old days, you could start a Sunday doubleheader at noon, or a weekday doubleheader at 5.30, and know that five and a half hours later, everybody was packing up to go home. You got two games in and 20 minutes between the games. Right. Long enough to put on a clean jersey and eat a sandwich and go back out and play again. Now, if you did that, my God, if the Yankees and Red Sox scheduled a doubleheader, they would probably have to have I don't, I don't know. They probably have to have EMTs in every section in order to deal with the people who just grew too old and started passing away. I mean, a, a Yankee Red Sox doubleheader nowadays would be eight or eight and a half hours. Oh, with the pitching changes, if you look at a Dusty Baker Washington National game, um, it, it can be four hours with, you, with the pitching changes. <laughs> just. Um, I, I wonder if they're going to legislate that, if baseball is going to make some sort of rule ab- about that. Well, I can't even speculate on that. I actually happen to know the answer, but uh, I'm not allowed to speak about it. Oh, okay. Well, then uh, maybe we could talk about it off the air. We might talk about it off the air. We, we'll probably be able to talk about it on the air after February 1st. Oh, let's wait till then. I'll be surprised too, because I can almost guess that they're going to do something. That's. Um, I don't well, know I, I'll just eat. pose this question to you. Let us say that baseball has imposed a numeric limit on visits to the mound. Okay. And let us. Just for the sake of discussion, let's say that any visit to the mound counts. If a pitcher steps off and comes down and meets the catcher halfway, that's a mound visit. If the third baseman comes over and grabs the rosin bag and stands and talks to the pitcher, that's a mound visit. If the second baseman and shortstop come in and tell him who's covering on a play, that's a mound visit. And I don't know what the number is, but we'll just say there's a number. And whatever that number is, Your favorite team, the Nets, has reached it. And they have a 5-4 to lead in the top of the ninth inning. And and the relief pitcher puts the first two guys on base. Now what? Well, I I look at it in the same way. You can't plan for it. It's like the protest. How could you say uh, um, we'll, we'll protest the call, but you could only protest X amount? And um, any time you do something like that, it's going to change the natural flow of the game. Yeah, but I'm not talking about the flow of the game. I'm talking about tying runs on second, go-ahead runs on first, nobody out. I'd want my manager, I'd want the manager out there, of course, but maybe that's what's going on in the ninth. In the seventh, it was worse. It was the bases loaded. 
<laughs> kind of thing. So Fine. All I'm saying is you used up all of your visits. Now what? Your infield cannot come in to discuss whether they're going to run the wheel play or not. Your shortstop and second baseman cannot come in and tell you who's going to cover on a pickoff. Your first baseman cannot tell you I'm going to can't come into the mound and say I'm going to go to third base with anything that I can field. Yeah. Your pitching you know, coach I have, can't come out I have and a say what you guys to that. want to do. I have a solution to that. You put an earplug in every ball player's ear, and you let the manager talk into a machine. And you can, certainly you have Bluetooth technology that you could let the manager from the bench. Um, yeah. Jones, move over two steps. That that thing um, that would solve a lot of the problems. Well, I think there's an easier way. I think you follow the NFL's league. The quarterback has the ability to listen to, not talk to, but listen to one person on the sidelines. So I think you give the pitcher an earpiece that allows the pitching coach to talk to him. Mm. And then you work out a series of si- – and you work out signals from that point on how you turn around and communicate with your infielders while you're still standing on the mound, standing on the rubber. But if you have that simple thing, then you eliminate a lot of the less necessary visits to the mound where the pitching coach comes out and says, hey, do you want to walk this guy or not? Mm. In the old days, it was simple. You just had Willie Mays out in center, and he'd see the sign, and he'd direct it. He'd know which pitcher can throw which, uh, which ball to the strengths, and he'd move the outfielders over. And um, But you know what? Willie Mays is a hard to come by. Well, yes. Um, and it's, you know, it, 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 there's, there's so much money in the game now, Ralph. There's so much value in a victory. There's so much importance placed on making the playoffs and going through the playoffs and winning that, you know, it, this isn't baseball in the 1940s when there were unlimited mound visits during an inning. Unlimited. Mm-hmm. It was the American League in the 1950s that limited it to two, and it wasn't until the 60s that the National League followed suit. When I was a kid listening to game in the 50s, National League managers could go out to the mound as many times during the inning as they wanted to and didn't have to change pitchers. But see, under the scenario I just proposed to you, if, you're, if you've used up all your visits, if you step out of the dugout, you've got to take your closer out and replace him with somebody else. Well, now... You've got to, that means that if you're getting low on visits, you not only have to ration your visits, but you also have to have extra guys warming up. And now you're using up ups that aren't ins sometimes, as we said earlier in the broadcast. And you're talking about putting extra stress on the relief pitchers who will then be less successful when they do have to come in. And you're talking about games being maybe shorter if you're able to finish them in nine innings, but maybe more games that go extra innings. Yeah, I, when you're trying to fix something that may or may not actually be a problem, you are always subject to the law of unintended consequences. Okay. Well, last year they tried to fix the intentional walk by just declaring first base um I think it took something away. I think there was always that possibility that a guy will step over the plate and smack one. There was always the possibility that um, the, the you know the catcher doesn't catch it. And then there's that added thing where you walk somebody and you a pitcher may or may not have trouble finding the plate on the next guy. Hell, there's also the situation of the pitchers who hate walking people because while they can throw the ball down the middle without any problem at all, they can't throw the ball wide. Exactly. Exactly. And then there was the fun of, of, like I say, a batter um, just ripping one that uh, 
they couldn't throw it wide. They threw it over the plate, and and that that part is kind of fun. And then there's debate. The debate: should you walk him? That kind of thing, you know, where he's the player is being walked, and the fans in the stand in the stands get a chance to discuss it, which is always been the best part of going to a ball game is the running commentary that one can have with maybe a perfect stranger sitting next to you uh different class uh, you're one of the you know different jobs but you come together to talk about baseball and that's something that the other sports don't have going for them um is is that that um, that experience of of meeting fa- meeting fellow fans and having the time between pitches to discuss the game. Well, it's certainly true that hardly anybody can really discuss hockey strategy, and hardly anybody can discuss basketball strategy in the limited amount of downtime that there is to discuss it. Um, and, and nobody football can discuss means- football strategy except uh, a San Francisco writer named Miller, who is the only football writer I ever – was was it Miller? I can't think of, even think of his first Ira. name. Ira, Ira Miller. Miller. Uh, the, was he a great foot – I think he's still doing it – a great football writer. <laughs> Just uh, – but it's very difficult for a novice fan to be able to tell you that, well, they're going to go up to the line, they're going to check off to the tight end, this type of thing. It's uh, Baseball has its – we've all played baseball. We've all hit and run as kids, or, you know, gotten the runner over, done, done those things. We know what it takes, even if you didn't do it professionally – to stand in the box when they're throwing a ball at you, in the case when you were a kid at 40 miles an hour, it still hurts, that, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, but we can't identify what it is to go up and, and slam dunk. We can't identify what it is to throw a, a pass into the end zone. Um, it's a great game. It is, and we should pick this up again next week. And we shall. Good luck in New York. Thank you, sir. It's a short trip this time and a long one next week. Why don't we then? Will you be back on uh, on Wednesday nights next week? You want to do it? Yes, I think Wednesday night next week works well. Beautiful. Let's try that and uh, go in peace. Thank you, sir. Talk to you next week. All right. Thank you. And I'm going to ask the audience if you enjoyed any of um, our offerings anywhere in the station, please box up some lightly used children's books and take them to the Head Start program in the community that you live. Kids need to read. They need to get their noses out of the devices and the games for a while. They need to read and develop a passion, and they need to become school-ready. So books will help, and um, I'd appreciate it if you do that. And we'll be back next week, same time, same bat channel. Be well, everybody. Um, See you then. Thank you again, Michael Duca. Thank you, Ralph. Adios.